And ladies and gentlemen, and now to take us through the Vikings, please welcome Dr. Laurie Fairman. Thank you very much. I'll, if I'd started walking across here, I'd start doing a tap dance, wouldn't I? Um, I'm going to talk about Vikings, and I'm going to hang on to this, I think. Uh, we're making, basically, I want to do some brief history, and uh, I want to talk about the myths and the legacies, or the legacy that they've left behind. Um, so basically, the word Viking means expedition by sea. And they did use that term. They didn't call themselves Vikings. Vik is uh, an inlet or an area around Olesund, which is quite near where, where we are now, actually, not very far away at all. Um, it's at the head of the Nord Fjord. So the, the, they used the expression Farla Viking, which means to go off on a raid. There's a, a lot of uh, similarity between Geordie and Norwegian, in case you hadn't noticed, like uh, Ingan is going in and Wutgang is going out. So what we see on time side, I'm going to tonight. Uh, and Fara is what we term used on fine si time side for going somewhere or far off. So Fara Viking means to go off on a raid. We, the Anglo-Saxons, called them Akama which is the Anglo-Saxon word for boaters, the word Viking wasn't really used until the Victorians started writing romantic novels. What you've got to understand is that, as you've seen with Norway, there's not a huge amount of the area that's habitable. A lot of it's mountain, a lot of it's moorland. Of course, this time of the year, a lot of it's covered with snow. And there was a, a, a period of global warming in the uh, medieval times, it's called the MWP, which just stands for the medieval warm period. And this led to basically a shortage of land. You might say, well, why should it lead to a shortage of land? Well, what happens, of course, the uh, Viking farmer, or the Norwegian farmer, left his land when he died to his son. It wasn't really enough to lend to anyone else. So anyone else had to go and do something else. Well, there wasn't really a lot to do. He didn't want to work the farm for somebody else, so he went out to seek a living, and you did it by raiding. So the ancestors, of course, they sailed around the fjords for years and years, so they had pretty good sailing skills, and they sailed around for hundreds of years. And then they exploded from their homeland around the end of the 8th century. One Viking got into an argument with another Viking, saying that uh, he's going to try going west into the North Sea and see if he can find anything on the other side. Well, of course, they had an idea that there was something on the other side, because fishermen had probably seen bits and pieces of the, of the land as it sailed across the North Sea. And... That at the time, the Vikings were following the, Scandinav the Swedish Vikings and raiding onto the German coast, uh, up the German coast towards Russia. Uh, and there wasn't much of a way of um, gold and silver that way, so they were starting to look elsewhere. And the first uh, raid, if you like, was actually not the one at Lindisfarne, which is the famous one, but it was at uh, Portland in, Den in uh, Dorset. This is Portland Bill, a very famous navigational part of Dorset. Um, and uh, the Vikings landed here, went ashore. Well, I don't know whether they've been to Portland Bill, but there's absolutely rock all there. Uh, it's a pretty bleak island, really. It's connected by an isthmus to the land behind it. Uh, and there's really not a lot there. Uh, and... Even even in those days, there was even less. And the local reeve had been sent by the lord of the manor to see who these strange people were. So he rode down to the Vikings. He talked to them. He didn't understand them. They talked to him. He didn't understand them. So they just chopped his head off and went home. So it was a bit of a dead loss, really. But the word got round that there's something over there. And so the first notable raid 
as you probably guessed, took place on the Holy Island Priory of uh, Lindisfarne uh, a year later, is seven, well, a few years later, 793. This is what came over. This is what Vikings looked like in those days. Uh, if you'd been in battles before, you'd probably stolen a helmet. If you hadn't, you just had a cap on your head. Uh, their main weapon was the shield. They used this shield. It had a big brass knob in the middle. And they used it for battering their opponents. They formed a shield wall and battered into their opponents after throwing their spears. Very few of them had swords. Swords were very expensive things in those days. It took a blacksmith a long time to make a decent sword because steel was very much in its infancy. So that uh, they used either battle axes or, or spears. So why did they do it? Well, first of all, you've got to understand that all the Norse lands were pagan. Nathumbria was Christian and it had monasteries and the monasteries were rich. The weather was favourable in those times. You had the medieval warming period and it was June where they've got nothing else to do at home. It's too early to bring the hay in uh, and too early to bring the harvest home so they're looking for something to do. And it wasn't too far, great distance to sail. So if you can imagine you've got men like that, healthy, young, brought up in a culture of violence, looking to make a name for themselves and to see the world as it was outside the, uh, where they lived. Because this is where they lived. Some would have their own huts, but generally it was in this communal hall here. Well, you can imagine a young violent teenager, you're 19 years old, you're as strong as an ox because you've been looked after, and you're having to live in there with your uh, aunts, probably not your uncles, your father's probably away somewhere, or dead drunk in a hedge. Uh, but you've got your mother there with a pile of sprawly, uh, pile of young children running round, and of course, aunts and uncles uh, with young children running round. So it was a real communal living. I don't think many teenagers could put up with that, and these certainly didn't. And remember, they had a culture of violence. They thought nothing of declaring war on anybody that offended them, generally by cutting their heads off. So the first big raid was right across from... Uh, they came round about the Stavanger area and they sailed directly across to here, which is Northumbria, North Northumbria, near the Scottish border. For some reason, they didn't raid Scotland very much. I don't know whether they didn't find anything worth stealing. Um, but uh, they seemed to be better organised in resisting the Vikings. They didn't want to fight a battle. That's not their style. They wanted to raid and get rich. So the quotation from the Anglo Chronicle of the time was rather interesting. They talk about dire portents appearing over Northumberland, which frightened the people. Whirlwinds, lightning, fiery dragons in the sky. And on June the 8th, the ravages of the heathen men miserably destroyed God's church. They were called heathens or pagans by the uh, inhabitants of Britain at the time. They weren't called Vikings. This is Lindisfarne. This is the castle on Lindisfarne. It looks a good castle, but it was always very small. It only had a very small garrison. It's been rebuilt, of course, by Lutyens. Um, and so the, the Vikings raided the church. If the monks got in the way, they killed them. Uh, they burnt the books and they stole the silver. Now, the Vikings were after two things primarily. They weren't there just to kill people. They only killed them if they got in the way because they could sell them. They wanted slaves. So they took as many alive as they could, took them back to the boats and used, sold them as slaves in the slave markets. The other thing they wanted was silver. There was very little gold around Britain in that time, so it's no good looking for gold. But silver was the coin of the realm, if you like. And if you had a silver dish or something like that, you cut it up and you got pieces the size of what used to be a sixpence. And that would buy you a day's bread. It would buy you a day a night in a hotel, an inn or something like that. So they used pieces, small pieces of silver 
as currency. This is uh, an echo, an echo tint of Lindisfarne Abbey, as it ru ru looked when it was ruined. You can see the Norman arches. This is obviously a later version. They didn't always win, actually. They came back the following year, when it was summer, and they raided Lindisfarne again, uh, to their amusement, I suppose, or their lack of knowledge. There wasn't anything there. The monks, of course, had been sold to slavery. Nobody had bothered rebuilding it. Uh, there certainly wasn't any silver there, so they sailed off down the coast of Northumberland. But, of course, it was seen, and they were warned that the Vikings were coming. And the next big um, monastery was this one at Jarrow, which is on the south side of the town, just far, no, far from Newcastle, uh, in 794, that's the year after the Lindisfarne raid. And what happened at Jarrow is that the, uh, the locals got together a little force and were ready for them. So when they got out of the ship, they gave them a good hiding and they uh, scuttled back to their ship and pushed it off the beach and sailed across the Tyne. And just there, sorry my hand's shaking, everything's shaking, um, there's what's called the Black Midden Rocks, and in just off Tynemouth, famous for ships being uh, lost there. They aren't now because there's too big piers to, to make the uh, sea much more calmer. But in those days there wasn't, and they sailed across the other side of the Tyne at the Black Middens. The men heard them coming, and they killed every last one. Some people say that's the best result Geordies have had for many, many years. <laughs> Didn't have one on Saturday either. Uh, so they, they, they didn't always win, but the word got back that there was plenty to be had. So they came back, and their speciality, of course, was raiding the monasteries and towns. The towns were generally fortified, and they weren't there in the, in, in the long period to have a siege. They were just there to hit and run, and this is them hitting and running and burning. So they came in Viking ships. The first one that's, uh, that you'll see or to talk about is a long ship. This was a naval vessel, very fast. It could do 15 knots, which is what we're doing at the moment. So you could imagine being overtaken by a Viking long ship. <laughs> we're doing about 13.2 at the moment. Long and narrow, quite light compared to the 100 men they were carrying. And they could be sailed to give the rowers a rest. And the other thing is, they could go to windward too. They, they did this by having this construction, which is called um, a planking construction of overlapping planks here. And that is very useful. It makes it very strong. It's easy to build. This is called clinker build. And you can see it's a very seaworthy ship. That's the prow. Uh, this is a, a foot a drawing of what it looked like. It's a bit foreshortened, but you can see that it had lots of oars along the side. It didn't have a hold or anywhere to keep things, which is very important. All it had were these uh, bags or boxes for the oars, the rowers to um, sit on. And they had to put all their worldly goods and their food in these boxes. It had a figurehead to frighten everybody, a steering oar at the back, and clinker built fore and aft. And this is a replica that was made by the Danes in um, a place near Copenhagen. And I, w I went to see it, uh, and I talked to the guy who um, was the captain on, on this ship when they decided to test it. And they sailed all the way around England uh, and put into Dublin, various other places, and sailed back again. And he said, hit a force nine gale, and it was a horrendous experience. You'll notice, first of all, there aren't any shields on the side. Again, that's poetic license. They didn't put the shields on the side. The shields were far too valuable. You might get one dropped overboard. You didn't want them sopping wet because it would rot the wood. Um, and the other thing he said, don't put shields on the edge here. They act as scoops. So a wave hits and it just scoops the water up in the shield and gives you a, a great blow of water in the face. 
The other thing he realised when he put this boat together, he had getting near, I think about 80 men all together to row it, because you need a lot of men to handle all these oars down the side. He couldn't find anywhere to put anything. So he worked out that the Vikings must have taken enough food for about two days. So they'd have to get across in two days, raid somewhere, kill the local produce, eat it, and then sail somewhere else, putting some bones in your bag, as it were. So that they weren't equipped for any length of stay. They were hit-and-run vessels completely. There's a ship museum in uh, Oslo, which is very good because it's got uh, a beautiful example which has been unearthed there. It shows you the uh, serpent's head. Uh, the other types of ship include the Hra. This is um, a much fatter ship and you'll notice that it has round about uh, 10 holes for oars. So instead of having all the oars, uh, 30 or 40 on each side that the long ship has, this is obviously going to be sailed as well as rowed. And it also has a little um, cuddy here, which would act to carry freight. So they could carry freight in this uh, round about um, 24 tonnes you could get into that. It was quite long, but it had a very wide beam of 15 feet, so it was quite stable. And it was used for longer voyages. Uh, smaller crews were needed, so you used a lot of sail. And this is the one that was unearthed. It's called the Gotland ship, Gokstad ship rather. Uh, and this was used for the burial of a Viking chief. Uh, and they've got a fair idea who it was uh, and where he reigned. This is uh, somewhere in Denmark. And, but the interesting thing was that they found his remains and they found the remains of his horse, but they also find, found the remains of two women. And the interesting point was that they reckoned that one of the women was of Viking origin and not young. So they reckoned that uh, it was the sagas relate that quite often the senior wife would kill herself and accompany her husband to Valhalla. But the other woman, uh, her DNA indicated that she came from Syria. So this was his chief concubine, as it were, who was also expected to die. So she was obviously a slave that he'd bought and brought all, well, hadn't bought her in uh, Syria. Nobody knows how she got from Syria to Denmark, but there we are. This is the sort of thing that happened because there was huge amounts of trade between these places. Another one is the clave. This was used for carrying animals and people, and it can be almost 20 feet wide and can carry quite a lot of material. But of course, being that heavy, it would be used for sailing, and they'd only have oars if they got stuck, as it were. How did they find out where they were going? Well, the first thing, You've got to listen to what your parents tell you, or your grandparents if they're still alive, which is improbable. Uh, in the long nights that you've just been seen, they would sit round the fire and they'd tell tales. These are written down and called sagas. Uh, and this, of course, helped you to give you an idea what the word was like. They're also very good naturalists. They'll watch the birds, the watercolour and the waves, but they still got lost. That was called snovilla particularly in the North Sea. If you're familiar with the North Sea, you'll know that you can have a lovely hot day in England, but the North Sea will have a low fog rolling in from it from the cold sea in the summer. So just as an example, you see, this is a gannet. This is Bass Rock in Edinburgh. And there's gannets flying about at the moment. But if you look very carefully at what they're doing, you get two types of behavior. They're fishing looking for fish, or they're migrating. So in the, when they're migrating, they fly very low down on the water in groups of a dozen, 15, perhaps 20, so that in the summer, if they're migrating, they'll be going due north up the North Sea. And in the winter, or in the autumn, when they're going away from 
the North Sea to the through the channel and down the Bay of Biscay, they're going due south. So if you can look at which way the gannets are going, you get a good idea of north and south. For a better idea, they invented this. It's called the Sun Compass. This was the piece of it that was unearthed on the Gottstag boat. Uh, this is a modern replica. And what it is, it's a very simple device. It's a piece of wood with notches cut in it. And in the centre is a rod or a spigot, uh, a pin or something of that nature. You drop that in a bucket. If it's in a bucket, if the ship's moving, that'll stay steady, of course, because it's in a bucket of water. And you would look at the shadow cast by this spigot here on the, on the wood. Now, if it's midday, that shadow will be at its shortest, and of course that shadow will point you north, because the sun is due south and the sun's making that shadow. You can actually use it as long as the sun shines fairly accurately, because you can say, well, it didn't have a watch. How could it tell when it was midday? Well, that's fairly easy. All you've got to do is just to make a mark all the time you're looking at this, and you'll get a circle of marks. And of course, the marks that are nearest to the center, those are the marks that you did at midday. So you can get the time, and you can get uh, an idea of north and south, so you could then get east and west, of course. Uh, if it was overcast, what they had was this. It's called a, a sunstone. This is a piece of uh, material called feldspar. Uh, it has the unusual property that crystals of it are polarizing. So if you hold that crystal up to an overcast sky, you'll be able to see where the sun is, because you'll get a bright spot where the sun is. You won't actually see the sun, but there'll be a bright spot that the sun has caused, and it's picked up by having a polarizer. So they even had polarizers in those days. They, they weren't very good on maps. Um, this is what they th drew, well, without all the detail, of course. They had a fair idea about Europe, but they reckoned that the Atlantic really was a pond, and that Greenland was connected to Asia and the American continent, and Africa probably joined America. They called this place up here Heluland, which means stone area, uh, and that's obviously Baffin Bay. They called this bit Markland, which is land of forests, which is southern Labrador, and they called this part Vinland. It doesn't mean wine, it means meadow, and that was the bit that was further south in Maine and uh, Nova Scotia and uh, Newfoundland. So they had several routes that they explored. The Danish Vikings and the Swedish Vikings generally raided along the coast of uh, Germany and they penetrated through the rivers right into Russia uh, and right down to the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. The Norwegian Vikings sailed north towards Iceland and Greenland, uh, around the corner in Scotland, in the, northern, the, the Western Isles of Scotland, and to Dublin. The Norwegian Vikings and the Danish sailed down the coast of France, they founded, obviously, the Normans in uh, Brittany way, Normandy, uh, and they sailed round the coast of Spain, and they sailed into the Mediterranean, and right up to Constantinople. So they were very intrepid travellers. And this is a map which shows the scope of their travels in uh, time. The darker colour here is the um, 8th century, so that was just the homeland of the Vikings. The next lighter colour here is the following century, the 9th century, where they had developed all the way along the coast of England, and they'd moved into Russia. So by the time of the, uh, the millennia, a thousand, uh, they'd, they'd got a, 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 a toehold into Russia and the Ukraine. In fact, the first king of Russia, who lived in, near Kiev, was in fact a, a Viking.
from Denmark. Uh, and of course, they penetrated the south of, Ang of, uh, of Ireland, around Dublin, and they also founded a colony in Sicily, and obviously one in, near Brittany and Normandy. So that they spread out. The parts in green were places they visited in raids but didn't actually settle. And you can see, for some reason, they never settled in Scotland, except in the Western Isles, and of course the far north. Uh, again, they never really um, settled in Finland and, uh, and around the coast of France and Spain. They just raided, and they raided around the Mediterranean islands as well. So that they did travel quite a long way. This is a Victorian painting of Vikings looking for new land. So here they are in their ship looking at the land to see if there's any possibility of settling there. And just so as not to uh, frighten the locals, the, the soldiers would be hidden under a sheet so that they looked as more peaceful than they actually were. This is what they really looked like, of course. Here's the Vikings landing. Uh, this is the chief. These are his house calls. Now, what he did, if he had the money and could afford it, he would have a retinue of warriors that he paid and looked after and, of course, provided them with feasting and drinking and everything else. And, of course, the more money he's had, the bigger the retinue. Uh, these were called house calls. And they, these were paid silver. He was called the silver giver because he would give these men silver. And behind him, you've got this mass of people which he's recruited uh, he doesn't pay them until they've got um, until they've made a raid and made some money, as it were. And he's usually accompanied by ravens to uh, pick up the bits, as it were. So there was a big drive for new fertile land, fertile land. There's a mention after the first sun, nobody got any land, so the grass was always greener. Uh, Bede, who was very famous and wrote the history of England and Jarrow. He commented that Britain's fertile forests, good pastures for cattle and draft animals. And in some places you can also grow wine. So it's come back to those days now, isn't it? Uh, and obviously the Vikings didn't read, but they could certainly put two and two together if somebody told them about it. And they thought, well, Britain's a good place to go. So. There were other reasons. The word came back from raids that there was money to be had. Respect, of course. You could make yourself a chief. You're a young lad. You've run away from home, as it were. You can make yourself a chief if you can uh, raid a monastery. They got into lots of trouble at home. They were forever killing each other. There was a tale, there's a lovely saga um, of uh, one famous hero. As a young man, he was in a foot race with all the other young men, and he came second. And the guy that was first teased him, so he cut his head off, which didn't uh, endear, endear him to the other guy's parents, so he had to scarper. So this was a very commonplace thing. They were forever fighting and getting into trouble. And don't forget, there's higher global temperature, so there's better growth. They got right up to Constantinople in Greece, this used to be on the dockside at Piraeus, but they've, uh, I think they've put it now in the museum. And this is an ancient Greek carving of a line, as you can see, but it's covered with Viking runes all the way around the side and down there. So some Viking with time on his hands carved this in Athens. And of course they landed at Byzantium and became quite important. Here's the big strong fellas meeting the Patriarch of Constantinople. They're offering them um, ivory from walruses, of course, and furs. I don't think he's terribly impressed, but he was impressed by their makeup. And they were employed as the bodyguards to the Patriarchs and the kings of Constantinople. And this is a, a 11th century uh, illumination, illuminated manuscript, by a, called, by a guy called John Scalites, and these are Vikings all the way around it. And this is the Imperial Guard 
In fact, one very famous Viking, Hard Rada, who I'll mention later, made all his money in Constantinople. Because if you were head of this guard, you decided who could go and see the king and the patriarch. So you could get a huge amount in bribery. Uh, they didn't get it all their own way, but it was obvious that the Vikings were a force to be reckoned with in uh, Istanbul or Constantinople. This you might have got, seen if you've been on a Mediterranean cruise. This is the Hagia Sophia Mosque, originally a church, and it's been demoscified or whatever it's called a museum now. But on the first floor, there's a gallery that goes all the way around, and on this gallery, they found these runes. And they were readable to a small extent, uh, and they said that uh, this is uh, Halfdan, uh, who was here in the ninth century. And when they started looking, they found lots of these runes carved in this cathedral in Constantinople. Presumably he was in the upstairs looking after the rich people and uh, he was a bit bored, so he got his knife out and just scraped his name on this piece of marble. So it's very good evidence how far they got. So they found that uh, there was plenty of land available, available, it was very poorly defended. What you've got to remember that in the ninth century, Britain was a very scrappy place. It had a few kings here and there, barons, uh, what we would call uh, dukes and things, all looking after little bits of land and fighting with each other. So they, they, they easily fell prey to people like the Vikings. But in 865, everything changed when the great heathen army came. Uh, this was the first attempt, uh, and they started off in the Thumbri, which they took very quickly. They settled in York, which became a Viking town, as you know, called Yarvik. And they gradually stopped, they gradually spread through England. They, they deflected from uh, Mercia and stopped at Wessex. Uh, and they were defeated in a critical battle. Alfred the Great defeated Guthrum at uh, Edrington in 878. Uh, and Guthrum said that he would allow himself to be baptized Christian if he, if he lost the battle, because it meant that Arthur, uh, that uh, Alfred's um, god must be greater than his gods if he, if he wins a battle. So in actual fact, uh, Alfred stood as proxy for him and as support for him when he was baptized. But he retreated to East Anglia and ruled in East Anglia. But the big thing that um, Alfred did to stop the Vikings was that he put all these towns in Wessex, he fortified them, and he got a local volunteer army to look after the walls. Well, don't forget, the Vikings were here to raid. Uh, they hadn't brought any supplies. They had to kill the local livestock. So they weren't at all equipped for a siege. Once they'd got round the town, as it were, and not been able to climb the walls, they'd go and kill a few chickens and lambs and things. Once they'd done that, there's nothing left for them. So they'd go somewhere else. Uh, and this was quite a successful campaign of Alfred's. In fact, he actually got as far as York, driving them north. So England looked like that in 878. This was all generally Viking territory here. The Danes were down here. Uh, Guthrum's kingdom was here, but Alfred ruled this bit, and Mercia was part of Alfred's domain, but quite often uh, fought over. And they built a tower to commemorate Alfred's defeat of the Danes at a place called Edrington in Wiltshire. Uh, this was built in Victorian times, as you can imagine. Dorset was often invaded because here's Portland Bill, here's the, the, uh, the, the downs at on the uh, Dorset coast. Uh, and there's quite good evidence that the Vikings raided here. In fact, I came across this in the, in the museum uh, near to Portland. And these bones, lots of them, were all recognized as belonging to a Viking raiding party. And they all had marks of uh, swords and spears and everything else. 
uh, and these were found on the Dorset Hill. And this is a sort of uh, reconstruction of what happened. These are the Anglo-Saxons who defeated the uh, the, the Ro Ro Marauding Vikings in Dorset. So it got a confused situation. Eric Bloodaxe, who's quite famous in Norway, he took control in 947. This is him. It's not a very good picture. Um, he was killed by his wife, actually. Uh, the, this is a whole series. It, it would take ages to go through Anglo-Saxon history because the kings generally reigned in little bits and pieces for about five or six years before somebody killed them, quite often the wives. Um, but the raids and the invasions continue. It was a very miserable time for most people. But gradually the Wessex kings got control until in... 991 at the Battle of Malden, the uh, the Anglo Saxons were very badly defeated by the Danes, uh, and they paid the remaining Danes off with silver. That's where you get the word Dangold, and they gave them three tons, over three tons of silver, which they went away quite happy. And so it went on. You got fighting, and Knut the Great came. And eventually, Edward the Confessor came back from Normandy to restore sort of Anglo-Saxon rule to Britain. This is the uh, this is the the empire of Nut the Great. And you can see he ruled Norway, bits of Sweden, Denmark, and most of England. However, at the end of the Viking Viking era came about 1066 with the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Harold. Goodwinson, who was crowned himself king of England, defeated his brother, Tostig, and Harold Hardrada at uh, the Battle of Snumford Bridge. This is near York, uh, and it happened in 1066. That's a popular date, of course, in English history. But poor old Harold was in London when the Vikings landed, and he marched 180 miles from London to Stamford Bridge in three days. Fought a battle and won it. And it's commemorated here. The 300 shiploads of Vikings came over and only 24 went back. So it was a real substantial victory. Of course, poor old Harold, having a good knees up, uh, celebrating his victory, somebody came and whispered in his ear and said, I'm sorry to tell you, but there's a guy called William had landed at Hastings with an army. So poor old Harold had to walk all the way back to London, get, gather some more troops as he went, and take on William the Conqueror at Hastings. If he hadn't had to fight that battle, I don't think there's any way that William could have won, because he, he only just won anyway. But uh, if Harold hadn't been so damn tired and all his troops so tired, I don't think they would have won. So, quick word about the Vikings in America. There's pretty good evidence they, that they reached the American continent. Uh, this is in the saga of Eric the Red. And uh, what happened was a guy called Bernie Johansson was sailing and blown off course. He was sailing to Greenland, but he was blown past Greenland. He saw it disappearing in the distance. And then he looked over the other side and he saw land, and he thought, that's funny, I've passed Greenland, there's land past Greenland. So he told Leif Erikson, and he got an expedition together, and here he is, this is a representation of Leif in a Viking boat, <laughs> uh, sight in the American continent. And what happened was that they left Iceland, settled in Greenland, then tried to go up through Baffin Island, Baffin Bay, but then they went down and they settled at a place called Lancio Meadows, which is in Newfoundland, right up here at Cape Board. And this is the map that they drew. So here's uh, Greenland, Faroes, Iceland, Norway, and America. So they were the genuine discoverers, discoverers of America. Usually what they did is they stayed uh, at Cape Board but it was very difficult to winter there because it was very, very cold. All the game went 
all the fish stopped. So they went back to um, Iceland for the winter. And all of his children reached Newfoundland, and this is the site which they excavated. This is what it looked like, an artist's impression, just a little bay, Jellyfish Cove it was called. And here they built a longhouse, but people say it's not there anymore. And there is good evidence, because these are the Viking pennies that they found at that site. Uh, and these were proven to be, um, oh sorry, site further down, they were proven to be actually silver Norwegian pennies, which is quite unusual. And the site was an American Indian site, dated up to 1235, and these uh, pennies fitted exactly into that. So that Viking silver pennies were found on the main car part of North America in Maine. So they really did get there. So it was the end of the era. Christianity took hold and they pretty well gave up. Their style of fighting was not very good. The berserkers uh, used to get themselves so worked up, they used to bite the tops of their shields. This is a berserker carved as a, a pawn in the Isle of Lewis chess set. Uh, and here it shows you how mad they got. But basically, their uh, tactics were very poor. It was really just a mob riot. So when you get against uh, organized defenders, they couldn't go in, they, they couldn't, couldn't win. Certainly, man for man, they were quite often defeated. So settling down became much more important than raiding. And it's often in the case of medieval warfare that it's the weapon that matters. This was the weapon of choice because it was the simplest to make, simpler than a sword. And this is a double-handed axe, which is a pretty violent thing. But if you swing at somebody with a double-handed axe, you only get one swing because it'll take you over your shoulder if you miss, and somebody will stick a sword in you or put an arrow through you. So that it was a, a one-choice weapon. Very good for terrifying monks, but not really for late medieval warfare. And the last battle was in Sky in 1283. They were not dirty savages. They looked after themselves. These are ivory combs made of walrus ivory uh, from a Viking burial. And they actually um, bathed once a week, whether they were dirty or not, which is very unusual for medieval times. They didn't wear helmets with horns. Uh, the helmets with horns come from the idea that Freya had a raven on her head when she went terrorizing local inhabitants. They just used helmets of a conical shape with cheek guards and nose guards. Uh, they didn't drink, from their, drink their beer from the enemy's skulls after the battle. Uh, this is a Viking drinking horn, a very expensive one because it's, uh, it's done with silver. Normally it wouldn't be done like that, it'd just be an ordinary horn. Disadvantage of an ordinary horn, of course, if you put it down it falls over and spills your drink, but this one if, can stand on a table. And the, the myth probably comes from the Norwegian cup, which means cheers as well. It's called skull, so it's easy to call that skull. They were very good with gold and silver. This is uh, gold and silver exhibits from uh, the British Museum. And you can see this pendants and uh, necklaces and earrings all in gold and silver. This one I particularly like. It's a solid gold ear scoop for taking the wax out of your ears. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. Even in those days, I had those problems. But their main business was really in slavery. And these often come up. This is a slave collar which was found in Dublin. And this was the real thing about the Vikings. That's what they did the most of, taking slaves. So... They left the legacy behind. The legacy is often in the names of villages and places. And most people have uh, Viking blood in them. The Queen can trace her ancestry back to Rollo, who came from Olesund, 
and was a Norman Viking. And it could, obviously you can use gene markers. Very high in Liverpool. This is pre um, the potato famine Liverpool families. They have very high uh, Viking genes. Uh, if you think that you're Viking related, if you look at your hands or your feet, if your second toe is long as the big toe or longer, that's a Viking characteristic. But a very marked Viking characteristic is this contraction that you get where the tendons in your hand tighten up and you have your finger bent over like that. And this is very much uh, an unpleasant legacy that the Vikings have left behind. They've left other things behind. This is what I see regularly when I go walking in the Pennines. It's called the Viking style. And uh, they're still amongst us, the walking the Pennines on Wednesdays. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I'll try and answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs>